It's December 28th, uh, 2017. It's two days, two, three days before the new year. I'm going to take you on an expedition with me today. The show is about two hours long. We're going to give you lots of pictures and videos. And it begins right now. Day full of stress and triumph and heartbreak. High emotions. You see these pictures like this, for instance, it doesn't do it justice. And when you have to navigate the whole coastline and it looks like, like these little places. And this is where today's story is Calvert Island. And Calvert Island. The day starts off early, the daylight is I think around 6 a.m. there's a May Day on Coast Guard. Mayday relay. All stations. All stations. All stations. This is Friendship for Coast Guard Radio. Friendship for Coast Guard Radio. Friendship for Coast Guard Radio. Mayday. This station is working for information on a four or five foot sailing sketch. Correction, a four or five foot sailing catch, the Aquila 2. The Aquila 2. Declared May Day at approximately zero three four five Pacific Daylight Time, and we received the call on Channel One Six Calvert Island. There is a lone occupant on board, and is believed to have an Australian or a New Zealand accent. All vessels in the area that are able to provide information on the whereabouts of the Aquila Two are requested. To contact the nearest Coast Guard station. This is Bridget for Coast Guard Radio. Over. Over. This is Bridget for Coast Guard Radio. Continuous broadcast transmitting at 2 1. What should we do, Zoe? Check it out, Zoe. Only a couple of miles away. Let's not screw anything up. a few miles away, there's a May Day. We're up at the top of Calvert Island. And so a 45 foot sailboat, that should be easy to spot. Just gotta take my time, make sure I got everything right. Okay, we'll so this is the morning. And the pictures I'm gonna be showing you today, these pictures in particular, or the same day later that day when the tide goes down. And we're going to bang right through it. So it's 
the 19th of August is 9.34 a.m. and the low tide is 10.16 a.m., 40 minutes from now. It's a 4.3 foot tide. And so we went out and we went left and we seen Coast Guard, the Cutter, we seen the Zodiac, the helicopter. And you gotta realize there's 27,000 islands almost up here. You had a lone sailor had come through early that morning, I guess about three hours before that. And they had put a call out for anybody to, to, to look out for a lost sailor. And so I don't know how that played out. We searched for about uh, four hours. Coast Guard was moving away from me on both sides, so I gave up in my area and I was limited to gas. You gotta realize I'm lost myself along that coastline. And so we suited up and abandoned our boat And we headed out ourselves. And we'll tell that story today because some stories should be told. Remember, let's keep going. Surf Island is sitting back on up. our spot right now. We're in behind these islands here. Turn it up for you. Oh, I'll you turn music off it's here. Real, Coming it's up. real time. Let me zoom out. Let me zoom out. Anytime you're ready, Pewter. Okay, I'm still, I'm right here. Just remember. Let's keep going. Surf Island is right by me. And I'll call the Surf Island for something to do. La, 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 la. And you can see my pad all the way up to here. And I got no idea why there's a triangle there, but I'm in that triangle. I didn't draw that particular line. But that's the line. We went all the way up to Portland Inlet. And we're all the way down the west side. And so I'll zoom back in. It's way down now. We're and so what we're doing is every 20 miles of the open ocean, and there's all these islands where you run in, hide away, drop your anchor, but then you got to go back out to survey the open side of the coastline on that particular expedition. There's Vancouver Island is down right there. There's Vancouver Island. And we're going to go around the top of that and out the outside of that. And I can't remember how long that island is. It's... 400 kilometers or something, or 400 miles, I can't remember. Yeah, 400 kilometers probably. And that's the American border down here. And so we're right here and we gotta go to where my pinky is. And we are already covered. Where am I again? I lost it, there's about, we are already covered. So half the distance is done, we're halfway mark. We're at a halfway mark and there's a bit of a lump out there today. And so we're in that big bay. We're exposed to the West Coast, right? West Coast comes straight in through, in through there. And I'm going to go, the sun is shining towards the island here. So we'll do that shoreline and do these edges. And by then maybe get enough sun over on that side. But it's foggy out. It's foggy out. It's dark out. It's supposed to gale again, a gale last night. It's supposed to gale for the next several days. And I'll just, you can see, it's 40 minutes before low tide. We've got everything put on the Zodiac, it's all ready to go. All you gotta do is put the GPS on it and the camera case. And there's a survival bag with flares and everything down in that hole back there. And we've got quite a mess here on that camera, the underwater camera. I had to go get a charger. And so we missed the last three days underwater. Both of the chargers went down. I bought two new ones, $50. And which is, I'm just grateful I can charge up the batteries, so I don't really care. But they're, they're strange batteries. You gotta take them out and put them in this charger, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, uh, quite a freaking mess here. But it's all, it works. It works, it works. I've been hitting the boost in the hopes that'll give me some extra energy. Gotta remember, take that with us. Do you not? Yakin. Okay, well, that's it. That's an update for August the 19th, 
2015, the fifth expedition. You can see, I should have that on a tripod. And I got one tripod left. I'm at the Boston Three Tripods this trip. Just um, like unbelievable tough trip. Everything went wrong. But we got it each day in, so whatever. I'm doing this burn it for the rest of the day, trying to stay alive. Nice, nice in here. As soon as you go around the corner, it gets ugly again. But this is a nice little nook anyway. And Dana out. <laughs> Dana out. <laughs> I should watch these clips before I start showing them to people. <laughs> Dana Hoot! I was being Mr. Cool, I guess. And so let's rock it, because that's what this is about. And so what we did is we boogied along, and we'll bring up the pictures to big for you. So what we're doing is species counts. We're going to go looking for the missing species. The shoreline should look like that to your left. And up close and personal should look anything and everything like that or that, for instance. You should see the sea urchins absolutely, literally and figuratively everywhere you go. You shouldn't be able to land the zodiac anywhere on the coastline because of those little... I used to pick 20,000 of them a day. And so there should be 700 algaes. And I'm just going to pop myself back in the video. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. It's um, 6.13 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, British Columbia, Canada time. We live stream at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hi to everybody. Hugs, everybody. And I got you in the comments section there at this point. And so... What I'm going to do is species counts, insect, birds, mammal counts, what we did along the entire coastline. And so we know the species that are supposed to be there, right? It's really easy to, to spot it if it's there. And if it's not there, it looks like that behind me. And it should be around 700 algae, and we're going to zip through roughly 1,300 pictures in the next hour and a half or so, hour and 45 minutes, and several more videos. And I'll bring it over to another format where I can zoom in because that's always fun, right? Let's do it. Oh, that's going to be a problem. Let me fix it. I fix it, Dana. Oops. I can't figure it. Uh, just one second. Oh, gotta go the other way. Sweet. There we go. Almost. All right, now we're good. Now I can zoom in, zoom out. Okay, here we go. So it's early in the morning, we're catching, the tide is still falling, and then you have slack tides about 40 minutes. Now, we're doing every 20 miles of the coastline, and so we leave the big boat back there. You can see it hit away back here, and the boat's nice and secure back there. We got the little Zodiac, it burns no gas. Now, that morning, I burnt 35 gallons or something. I end up having to run back up the coast to get fuel. I don't have enough fuel to keep going the direction I'm going anymore because we went looking for a lost sailor. And you just, what are you supposed to do? You got to give it your all. So we could burn 35 gallons and that's what we've done. Coast Guard was there. Anywhere I thought Coast Guard might not have ducked in, but we're looking for a 45-foot wreck. So we're looking for debris, oil spills. We're looking for, you know, some kind of visible. Because you, when you come in and hit all these rocks, something stays behind, you know? It's, it's, you got a good chance of grounding your boat at least that much. And when the tide comes up, you might be in a lot of trouble if you're hurt and you can't get out of there. But um, there's a good chance the boat is going to be visible. So we, we've done everything we could at it. And, 
the people that donated the money, I'm sure would have wanted it that way. And what you're looking at is the rocks uh, should be covered in life. I'll back that up. So you should see all these visible colors. The, the ones I'm showing you, the marine life I'm showing you, is British Columbia coastline. And the whole coastline should uh, have that. Let me make sure I'm back there all the way. So the algae you're seeing, there should be 700 algae. This particular algae you're looking at is what's known as bull kelp. And we got to keep motoring. We got to keep motoring. I got it on this auto mode now. Every five seconds, it'll jump. So we're looking for species. I'll jump it quicker because we got 1,300 pictures to get through. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm photographing as much of the rock as I can. And then we can do stuff like this where we can look at it and see ourselves. And because I got it on autoplay, I got to just get myself acclimated to that. And so you're looking at a handful of species of algae at best. If they disappear, the rocks will be naked like the moon, that particular rocks and, and all the rocks. And this is actually a lot of species, which is not. There should be 7,000 species. And let me uh, come back up to the top. And so when you think of this, the rocks, because this is before and after in the same spot. This is Louise Narrows where I was to a different place hot further up the coast on the outside island uh, archipelagos. So you can see a couple of sea urchins in that, in that, or starfish. And most likely, and that's what you're going to see is those starfish over and over and over. We're on the west coast of Calvert Island. Calvert Island, just let me, uh, I'm not sure if I, Tell you where Calvert Island again is too is roughly around where top of my finger is. I'm sorry, right around the top, right there where my finger is is Calvert Island, the last red arrow right there. And then the green is the north or the south end, the cap of uh, Calvert Island. And it doesn't look like it, but there's 27,000. All the arrows where we surveyed, we took species counts, insect, birds, mammals, animal counts. Let's keep rolling. And you'll get uh, the one starfish and the one sea anemone over and over and over and over. You can see a little orange, little peck speck in there. And we'll get good shots. And purple. So orange and purple starfish are the same, they're the same species. They just come, they also come in a brown color, but you don't really see that. Now the algae, as you're going to see coming up over the next number of pictures, is very, very very, very bad shape. Let's run back to that picture. But we got good pictures coming up, just so I can zoom in right quick. The algae. Oh, yeah, it's still playing. Didn't stay there. It's okay. Let's keep rolling. Chernobyl. Uh oh, I forgot. If I do that, I get into trouble. It's okay. Because I'm I'm dragging in these pictures, so that's a good uh, it's a good way for me to find out how far along I've been. Worst case scenario, we cover a few pictures over. So the algae was uh, all of the whole coastline. What I'm going to show you coming up will be the same. The rocks were naked except for a couple of algaes, and the stain you're seeing on the rocks were all the species that normally would be there. They melted, physically melted, physically melted into the rocks. These things have disappeared and they're never coming back. And so you'll see these same species through all my pictures at my website, the nuclearproctologist.org. Make sure I got that geared up so we can na nail that up there when I say it. Because it looks professional when I can pop it up there, right? When I say it. And here you see uh, seven or eight algaes. We're on the west coast. You should see 700 algaes. You see the purple starfish up there. You see a bit of bull kelp. You see some common 
kelp or kelp cabbage. So we'll zoom in on all these spots, I'm sure. I got a tendency to do that. Now, I'm, I'm a horrible person with a picture, with a camera. I should never be allowed to have a camera. And Paul and Audrey had donated these particular cameras. There was three of them. We still use them today. And we're extremely grateful. You can actually see my reflection in the kelp deer stood up taking a picture. <laughs> How friggin' weird is that, eh? Like an eyeball. And it is what it is. But the kelp didn't kill my motor a single time. It just shredded like toilet paper. Like, you know, uh, when you look at the kelp, the kelp should be a beautiful, shiny, symmetrical colors. And the whole coastline, the, the bull kelp looked like that. And all we seen hanging out in the kelp for the most part was the bullheads and these little fish. And that's what whales were feeding on because the, uh, um, the krill and the sardines, the anchovies, the squid, is everything is for the most part missing. We didn't find any at any time. The krill was missing too, more importantly. And phytoplankton and the krill during the big blooms, we would have been able to see some of the connotations. So when you see the kelp like this, this is, you, can, you won't put this in your garden. You're not going to eat this. You're not going to buy this from a shop. The shop is not going to purchase it. Um, animals are not going to consume it. This is not indigenous. And I worked underwater for thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in these very spots. And I'm quite familiar with the incredible diversity, the amazing, incredible amount of life that is normally there everywhere you look. That's what was the draw for me, you see? And there's a... Uh, now, this bull kelp, when you come up to it, that looks pretty good. But, of course, as you look at it, you realize that it's emaciated, too, is the only way to describe it. It's starving for nutrition. It's starving... And now, so you see the green sea anemones, adults uh, out of the water. This is a rare picture, folks. Very rare picture. You can find it at my website, the nuclear proctologist, under the Calvert Island pictures in August 2. And so, if um, this is one of the rare, rare pictures where there's, you, there's quite a few there. That's why I'm doing that particular show tonight because it's actually not. It's just the, the orange and the purple are the same species, and the green comes in different colors. The green sea, this is the giant plume sea in anime, the green ones. They come in three colors normally, and I can bring up some depictions for you of that, which makes more sense, right? So you get them in this color way more than in the green. The green is the least number you would normally find. And so they were wiped out for some reason. And then the green, uh, it didn't take over. It'd just be one of the few that survived. And so these were, and these are garbage. These would be, this is considered garbage. Now you can see the, the Clintons on a rock. Uh, these are fairly small. We only seen three adults in the whole coastline. What we do is the low tide zones. You can see they're melting. That guy, that orange one, he's actually melting there. All of them are certainly none of none of those starfish are healthy. None of them are going to survive. And but the 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 green starfish is unique. <sighs> Sit up straight here, Dana. You got a microphone? Move it. Um, but this was the most life we've seen anywhere. So instead of seeing this incredible, unbelievable, unimaginable diversity, incredible, unbelievable amount of life, everywhere you looked is just this wonderful, 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 incredible experience, you know? And then to see it all just gone. It's pretty heartbreaking. Make sure I don't use that again. Here we go. Go back to that. And so the green scene enemies, 
and the purple and the brown, you can see one there, reddish brown and an orange. They're all the exact same family. Um, orchard, they're called the orchard. Now those starfish, those sea anemones, the green ones, they're not very big. But the whole coastline would be completely full of marine life, not just these two species and a handful of algaes. But this was emblematic of the entire coast. This was emblematic of the entire coastline. And we'll start boogieing and we got a nine minute underwater video coming up. I think it's nine minutes. There's two of them, but it's quite a ways away. I'm going to start boogieing to get to it. And so this was huge. Obviously, I took a ton of pictures. I documented that whole shoreline like I had showed you in the video earlier. And this is what we found in Calvert Island. It was just a little bit of bull kelp. This was unusual to see the bull kelp out of the water. You were seeing it in places we documented, but it was unusual, right? What was unusual was the rocks were naked, all of them, and all the other species were missing. And so it becomes very boring. This is a sponge you're looking at there, and you can see baby white sea enemies. They'll grow up. When they grow up, they'll change their shades. They'll look like that. They'll be, and they're about two and a half, three feet. The whole, every rock should look like that rather than be naked or covered in, in muscles and uh, just very visible colors. Certainly, uh, you don't ever expect them to be naked unless you're in a harbor full of pollution. And so that sponge was significant. Uh, there's red and white sea anemones right there, baby sea anemones. That was only one of five or six spots of the whole coastline out of the whole coastline of Canada, British Columbia, Canada, this was, this was only one of five places where we found a, a little tiny spot, and that's all we found, right? It was that little small spot. Out of everywhere we looked on the map behind me, that's the Canadian coastline. It's all mapped out up at the website, the nuclearproctologist.org. And so this is no bling bling for this particular show because there's nothing to look at in the picture, right? That's what. Uh, but it was so important to document it. And this, everything, every rock on the coastline should look like that, every rock. And certainly... Most other coastline, just these little spots you would find. That's, that's just little spots, like 8 feet or 12 feet long. Uh, and we found five of them or so on the whole coastline. Remember, I was sending three people out there. I never got on the boat for the first number of months, right? I didn't get on the boat, period, for the first couple of months. We sent people out, and they took the same pictures. I went out and documented it because we we're going to go bankrupt and it was better to go out and just stay there on that little dinky and get it done. Otherwise, it was never going to get done. And I had no concept of when it was going to be done until I felt that I'd done the whole coastline. When we conquered the whole coastline for sure, got every spot, every major inlet, every major... And so the arrow is only representing where I spend a week, two or three weeks. And I would go long way, one way, long way, the other way and have like a base point. We'll be doing the same thing on this the future expeditions. And so you expect to see incredible amount of life. You, know, you, you expect to see just incredible richness. And I should bring that up for when I'm in a bay or something. So when you look at these big rocks... Find a picture of the rocks for everybody. See, a rock should have just everything should be clinging to it, right? It should be just these, these amazing colors. It should be completely full of life everywhere you go. That's, 
You should, you should just love in every second of it, you know? And it stands the exact same species everywhere you go. And so this is just, um, there's a green and there's white and a red sea, sea anemones, baby sea anemones there. And there's a big giant plume sea anemone and then there's the orchard starfish. And that's all you're going to see for the rest of the day. This was the extraordinary spot where we found these little clumps. And so we kind of went overboard and took, not overboard, but attempted to get, I take so many pictures in the hopes I can get one good one. <laughs> I got a thousand pictures. One of them's going to turn out, buddy. You can be sure of it. And it does, right? But I, I always assume that anybody that really was trying to, like any, academics out there that was actually seriously looking at the information. We'll take the pictures, put it through software, and um, remaster the, the picture, get rid of any of the screw-ups that I do, and wouldn't be able to do reasonable species counts, right? And at the future, that would be done automatically. Download them, run them through a shredder, and the shredder would take each picture, remaster it, make it crystal clear for whoever was doing it. And they can do a better count or they got better pictures to work with originally. But these are very high quality pictures. It's just you're on the ocean, the boat is moving the entire time. But to me, I'm documenting that whole spot like I showed you in the earlier video. I'm documenting every square footage of those rocks and that side and those points of the island because the sun is shining that way. So I'm attempting to gather the documentation to... And so when the whole coast is done, there's a joint, not a joint, but a um, baby Clinton. And so that starfish, the orchard starfish, obviously are not healthy. They're, they're melting. They're well on their way to dying. The green plume sea anemone, you normally find the entire shallow high tide line out of the water at high tide would be full of those green ones. So maybe they got a better immune system because they're always normally out of the water, the green ones. But you don't find anything out of the water at the high tide line. The high tide line had all kinds of marine life that lived there at the, at, at, above the high tide, lived in a salt spray with insects included, just a massive amount of insects at the high tide line. And... Um, and plants and flannas and floras and other marine life lived at that high tide line. That was completely wiped out off the entire coastline. It's all gone. Uh, you can see the sea anemone sucking up a what looks like a mussel. And it looks like the giant California blue mussel. And they were rare to find. We, they were one of the few mussels you did find when every rock should be covered in mussels. Uh, we didn't find any. Well, there was a little spot off Bella Bella now that I think about it. But generally, every rock, no matter what part of the coastline, interior or exterior, if it was naked, of other species would have been covered in, in uh, mussels. So all of these sea anemones would have lived in harmony with the mussels. The mussels are probably... Whatever you see the black slime... There was a black mold on the rocks that the divers... Because I hung out with them for a couple of months had was asking did I think that had something to do with Japan, the black mole, because it was displacing all the marine life underwater. And they had dove a lot of these spots over and over and over. We were using them for a fuel platform, food platform, watch a few movies, hang out with a few people. And they're bigger boats than me. When we finally went to Queen Charlotte City, we went our own ways. I trucked the boat all the way up, right? And they couldn't do that part of the coastline in the winter when we were doing that. And so as I go along, so you can't just crawl up in every rock. What you're doing is you're going along in your boat and you're documenting, documenting the coastline. There's not a lot of places here, obviously, I can go ashore. There's no species to collect. I know there's an idiot murder machine out there saying then it didn't collect any species yeah because there was only less than 100 coast wide originally there was 7,000 species so originally the coastline would have been just incredible 
amazing. You know, when you think about how much life, how beautiful the coastline really truly was. To me, this picture here, this really, this is the coastline as I understand, as my memory. See, I used to always feel guilty because there's nowhere to trip, right? And so you feel guilty when you do it as much as I had because there's nowhere to trip. And not only that, it's very dangerous. <laughs> Because if you you know if you stick one of these things in your feet underwater, for instance, um, the repercussions are forever per se. Let's keep rolling. We're almost up to another video, a dual video, I do believe, of underwater, above water. I'm not sure what I got done. We'll see you coming up here. So look how bad the kelp, that whole coastline of Canada, the entire coastline, from one end of Canada to the other end. I've done it all. I documented it. It's all up on my website. There's no maybes about the things that I'm saying. There's no ifs about anything that I'm saying. There's no unashtenas. Then it doesn't know. There's none of this nonsense, okay? You can go out and pretend all you want that I don't know, but you are wrong. You are so wrong. And for that, then we all pay a price because you're not willing to accept the truth because you have your bigotry and your bias and your prejudice against me, who actually went out there. I have more water. I have more hours underwater than all the academics here in British Columbia combined. Yeah? I have something like 14,000 hours underwater. Academics don't do that, see? And because it's still nice outside, right here anyway, not nice, nice, but... It was windy the night nice before. It's, it's a long day. We'll do a little survey out here. So we just moved, obviously. Actually, these are not in order. The videos, really this parts bad. of videos coming up. It's like everywhere we go, the kelp looks terrible. Probably can't see it. It's a very short video. And... There's a couple of starfish right there. It's just a one species. It's a sickly looking orange. And the purple has got a lot of white on it. And that kelp. It's because I got that dark filter on. The other one's broken. Not much you can do. I can do so much. Let's get some pictures, I guess. Yeah, I actually go back and change the filter. I think that video is coming up too in a bit. So look how sick that kelp is, though. Isn't that something? Got to start boogie in here. And as you go through the whole coastline, it looks simple. It looks easy. I can assure you there's nothing easy about anything that I'm doing. There's zero things easy about that getting in there, making it back every day. This is the open coastline. We had uh, storm force the night before. We're going to have storm force again that night. And so I'm still duck hit away on the corners of the island trying to get out into it. But we, uh, we had storm weather the whole time I came down the coast, the open coastline, right? So as I came down top of Canada by Prince Rupert, I came down every 20 miles, I stopped and done a survey, every 20 miles of the coastline. And so we took some beating trying to pull that off. And so you expect to see just this incredible amount of marine life. Let's keep going. Now, here you're seeing blue sea anemones and some big barnacles. And some gooseneck barnacles, not very good, obviously, in that picture. And we've seen roughly 20 spots like that on the entire coastline, I guess. It's all up at my website. Maybe that picture is a bit better for zoom, zoom. And so there's gooseneck barnacles, obviously, if you're not like me, you can recognize it. And they're very unusual for the whole coastline of Canada, but there are uh, industries here on that. 
for quite a few years. So they are here, obviously, right? And then you expect it on the west coast in the really roughest spots. That's where you expect to find the gooseneck barnacles, and we did. So that's all open ocean. And what I'm going to do is try to... It's a trick. You got to get into the shoreline, not to damage your prop or not hurt the boat or rip the boat open because you're in a zodiac. And it just takes one thump and you're in trouble, right? And you're isolated. You're segregated out there by yourself. Well, Coast Guard happens to know because that morning they seen me several times out looking with them. So they know. Um, Who I was, obviously. And they probably, I originally probably thought I was one of them, I'm sure. But the helicopter flew right over me and came right down. It looked me up, I guess, some nuclear proctologist. It was pretty obvious what I was up to because I was, they would have known my VHF radio was on. They can tell the VHF single. They would have known I picked up that Mayday for sure. So gooseneck barnacles, um, around 20, 25 spots on the whole coastline. These were just very tiny spots. And normally they are, uh, this is covered in mussels. And the goosenecks are usually sitting on the mussels and the barnacles. They all live in harmony. The barnacles are mostly missing and all the mussels, except for a small few as you've seen, and we'll continue to see are there. And so this is the extended version tonight. We're going to burn, burn, burn through these pictures. We got a friggin' long way to go yet, so I better kick it in the gear. Once, uh, I'm pretty good though, once I start moving. So there's just two species of algaes there. There should be 700 plus. There should be all the other invertebrates and species. And there I'm putting the camera, ca camera underwater. That means we're going to go to the double pictures. Uh, I'm not sure what to call these. Like I, I recorded this in high quality this morning side by side because it's too hard to do it in real time and live stream it. Like I'm live streaming everything I'm doing right now. <laughs> Everybody's just wondering what's going on. And so if you take your time... You can't put produced material like I do. But if you got the go and, and the energy, you can tell that story in just a couple of hours my entire day with just incredible amount of documentation. And so what I done was synced up the cameras. Does anyone will jump? I'll turn it up. And this is about nine minutes, and so I'm going to duck out for nine minutes. Here we go. No fish jumping, Jackie. Sorry. Uh, maybe 15 on the whole coastline, 15 spots out of 260 days.
leather and black starfish down there. Inside of that rock, so we let's go ahead and look at that. No, oh, some babies you see here. Break a leg off your tripod, how hard it is to control. Let's get back in there. Drifting right on the rocks. <coughs> Let's keep going. We'll get her. Okay, so we'll get another beach in a minute.
It's about two minutes to go. And I'll show some of these, what it should look like underwater a bit, so everybody can appreciate it a bit better. get her and so we don't have to lug the camera around anymore we, we will but I'll show you those pictures in a second I was talking about for color wise so you can appreciate the color well I'll show them to you right now uh, not uh, right, you can see the difference in the colors right away. Let me big shots first. So underwater, this is what it should look like at uh, low tide lines, up to thirty feet down. Should be a huge amount of life uh, everywhere you look. Just an incredible, unbelievable amount of colors you would expect. These are the authentic pictures. And so these in particular, you expect to see football fields, like football fields and football fields of the Red Sea urchins. But you expect to see that incredible diversity, yeah? <laughs> well, that was why everybody came to British Columbia for. This is what made BC amazing, incredible, unbelievable, inconceivable, just wonderful. Unfortunately, those days are long gone. And what was it? I was say, um, we're up on YouTube. Beautiful girl by Dana on YouTube. I'm sorry, I don't got no superhero name. I apologize for not having superhero's name. But you can be a superhero, get a GoPro, you'll be fine. If you got a Facebook or a Twitter and you decide to share me, you should be aware that the goblins are going to be sure to follow. And so all the answers you want for the rebuttal are in my, any, just about any of my video, videos, you can destroy their narrative. So put me in your bookmark, not just a subscription. I don't care about a subscription. Put me in your bookmark. You can find me later when you come to your senses. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that in, when you finally discover there's another world and you want to help, 
you can find me. You'll say, no, he's in the bookmark somewhere. I'll find him. And you will, see? And put your windmills on the mountain where the wind blows all the time. And if you do that, then you don't need oil plants or gas plants or coal plants, which are all better than nuclear, by the way, or nuclear plants. Anything is better than nuclear. Well, besides Spider-Man or the Hulk or this or that or them or those or whatever the freak that is or this is. No matter what robot shows up, the bigger ones are right around the corner and then it's game over. And so, back to the reality. To our reality. And to hi to everybody in the comments section. Now, let me back that up one more time. I smurfed that up. Hang on. So for underwater on the next expedition, um, I must have cut it off up high. Hang on. Almost there. Everything is right around the corner. Except for Dana. I got it. And so this thing here is an underwater RV that we will be taking with us ne next time. Something like that, Dana. That's pretty good. Hang on. And so this is good for 100 feet down. We still haven't got that activated, like a lot of things, right? We still haven't started up the new airport motor. We only put the Zodiac in the water, the new Zodiac in the water once. Everything's getting ready for the next expedition. But instead of dragging a camera around, which is fine, and I'm proud that we were able to do it and show you that footage tonight, using this one means I can stay there for up to, say, 20 hours, just sit there. I got lights on it. It's got a 4K camera on a gimbal. And I'm not going to be driving around like a race car. It's going to be, dear, take my time, get beautiful shots. Every shot will be beautiful, every video. If not, delete it and shoot it again. So when I come back this time, we're going to have some rock and roll footage from underneath with lights. They got two beautiful lights on it. And I will conquer this. I can assure you, I will see this through for sure. No maybes about this. And so some little small barnacles, you can scrape them off with your hand. Normally they would rip your hands to shreds and they're, uh, they're getting destroyed because they're not healthy, right? The whole coast was the same way. And so what we're doing is we're going through the coastline every 20 miles for anybody who's joining the stream or is not quite aware of what I'm doing here. Who are you? I'm the nuclear proctologist, Dana Durnford. I dedicate my life to exposing reality, I suppose, but to studying the extinction level event that is playing out. So we see the orchard. These are all from the same mommy or daddy. And you can see they're melting. And let's rock her back over to the other one here. You know? There you go. Bigger picture means better. Yeah? Sweet. So they're not healthy at all. They're going to pass at some point. And we better start kicking. Well, I'm, I'm just going to keep going until the... Um, happy with the stream i'm not going to be stopping because i reached any limits i'll be going till i reach my stream till i tell the story that i set out to tell this morning <laughs> no, i got a haircut too dana got a haircut 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 oh i can't see 
said to the blind man, talking to the deaf man, was listening to a mute, tell a story, can't see. And so who had the bigger problem? That's what my dad used to say. And the answer was me. Because I have all my functions. And I should be helping. So you see mutated starfish there. Bless his little heart. I think he's a mutated starfish, that feller. Ooh, no, that's a piece of kilt. He's uh, melting, but he's not mutated. I, uh, yeah, he's kind of mutated, that guy. Let's keep boogieing, boogieing, boogieing. So a lot of these pictures are going to be shit pictures, which makes it a little easier to get through all the pictures because I get to cruise through that picture. Unless it's important, then I'll stop and recognize and tell the story. You get, you're in a boat, you're drifting, you can't get up there and climb all around it. It's better to go out. Is it better to go out and map out miles and miles and miles of underwater and coastline and on the shoreline and document it relentlessly and have that publicly available? Or should I just collect whatever species is left? See, we can't collect the 7,000 species that are missing, right? There's over 7,000 species missing from these pictures. And where's the double pictures? Let's sweep over for a minute. Can I take them? Hang on. And so the whole coastline, there's over 7,000 species for anybody that's not familiar. And we'll show some of that color coming up. Let's jump along through these because we got a lot to get through yet. So all you're going to see is the orchard and you're going to see, now it's very unusual to see the black Clinton's uh, like, it's almost impossible to find an adult. And to find the young ones, we did in probably 50 places we found or more, just one or two or three each day of the young Clintons, just baby Clintons, right? And they were usually found in tandem with baby sea enemies. So you got sponge star, uh, the orchard sea star, uh, algae, a couple of algaes, barnacles. I got 12, 14 species there. That's actually a rich little spot when it's supposed to be 7,000, Manya, but compared to the rest of the coast, that's actually a rich little tiny spot right here. And this is at Calvert Island, British Columbia, Canada. And this is a far cry from what it should look like, obviously. If you've been following any of the videos so far, you would understand that the, after doing the whole coastline, I don't know why does that happen, I wonder. There's the picture I tried to sweep into the mix I got here. So I got two opposing windows, right? And I can sweep in from one window into this formatting. And the equipment I'm using is just like insanity difficult level. The software is over the top stuff. It's like way over the it's like way over the top. And just trying to master that, you know. It's, just, it's like going out mowing the lawn, waiting five minutes, and then the lawn grew. And now you got to go out and do it. And for some reason, you won't stop. And then a couple of months later, you've, the lawn finally stops shooting back up every five minutes, and you turn the lawn mower off and sit down, put your head down. But then get an update, and you got to do it again. So the software was just... <laughs> To learn how to use this particular, and I've went through a lot, and we do, right? I mean, the radar on the boat, I'm so good with the radar on the boat, I can see between two rocks or two wharfs or two boats. I can track boats comfortably. I can go in the blind, paint all my windows with my radar, and put the boat on the trailer. I can drive from one end of Canada to the other end and get to the wharf that I want to go and get on the trailer just by radar. <laughs> I grew up, there was no such thing as a radar or sounder. <laughs> I 
What are you talking about GPS? You had a had a mark on a hill or a tree, a Christmas tree or rabbit ears or whatever. So this was fascinating that we found these baby seeing enemies in this one spot, but no adults ever added to the water. I think there was one spot on the entire coastline where we found the joint sea plume. These are the baby sea plume and baby, the green ones too. This was the only, uh, we never found an adult out of the water and we only found the babies, these babies in five or six spots. Browning's Passage was one of them. Um, Telegraph Cove, aired off Telegraph Cove and that, that archipelago out there of islands. And I can't remember off the top of my head. You know, I, gotta, I consider myself a great memory for the most part. I, if I start thinking about it, I'll find it, I'm sure. But I'm not, if I does that, it means I've got to go find it and drag it in here. And I might have to cruise through 1,500 pictures to prove it. But we're not doing that today. And so you would find just a, a handful of these spots, literally. And they would have several thousand of these baby sea enemies, but this was emblematic of every rock on the coastline. Like the coastline was such an amazing diversity. It was such a rich... I went out and surveyed the entire coast, period. And this is what I'm familiar with. This is normal for me. This is what I expect to see everywhere I go. And so the disparity you're seeing is, is significant, trust me. It's hard to appreciate it maybe or accept it because you see a little bit of life and you say, well, you know, there's life there, Dana. And, and, but it's actually not. It's just a handful of species that are barely surviving. You can see that the orchard is melting. It's burnt, baby burnt. Because I'll take four pictures or three pictures in a row. Let's go back to that one. You can see the damage to the starfish. See how, how uh, like there's nothing natural about that starfish. Outside he's in that environment with those guys, which is natural. And it should be full of mussels there and sea enemies, like adults. And that's an abalone up there in the top. See that in the top corner? It's an abalone. We only seen uh, three or four spots with abalones out of the water. It was only one or two or something like that. I was tempted to eat them, mind you, but I didn't, of course. I didn't eat anything. I won't eat anything out of the Pacific. You have to be foolish. I won't even eat fish now, period. Never thought I'd hear that day. Seafood. I used to always dive down, right, and just pick whatever seafood I can pick with, by uh, free diving, even though I had tanks and compressors and and many, many different boats to do it, I, I would never use tanks to gather it up for food, only free diving. That way you wouldn't take any excess per se. And you're going to eat? Because it used to be mindless. Now you would starve to death, literally starve to death. There's no diversity. There's no, uh, all the species are missing. So when the birds come ashore here, this is why they starve to death. Go back to that picture. So that's a sponge. There used to be 74 species of sponges on the shorelines, on the rocks and that, coastlines. Um, and they come in multiple colors and sizes and thicknesses. And we only found, I think it was four or five sponge types. We did kind of find them along the coastline pretty regular for the most part. These. Uh, and so you get sick of seeing that picture, right? Eh? It gets pretty boring, don't it? You can imagine doing this all day, every day. And no matter what the weather is, you got to get out there and go up at low tide and get the job done. And it become my life, obviously. That become life. To, that's like some people get up and they watch TV or they go for a walk. I, I, I'm hunting a spot to go that's going to be safe at low tide for me and get set up and drop the anchor. I always like to keep the big boat close to me in case I break down because at this point, I'm still not very strong. Like, I'm not very strong right now. Um, obviously, somebody can push me over. There's not much I can do about it. But uh, on a good day, I wouldn't want to be somebody trying that. 
Uh, maybe because I'm not going to freak around. <laughs> You're going to get hurt if you mess with me. I'm not very healthy, so I'm not going to play games with anybody. Anybody that's trying to assault me, uh, like I will kill you. I will defend my life, right? Make no mistake about this. You will die if you if you try to hurt me. I will see this through. I will finish this out. We will get this job done. And I will defend my life because I'm not healthy. I can't take a chance on somebody hitting me. And so I will kill you if you try to hurt me. Make no mistake about this. You will die. It's not a game. Knocking me down will put me in a hospital for the rest of my life. I'm not very healthy. I've been to hell and, and back. I spent uh, over a decade in a hospital bed, and I had to do the whole coast because the, the planet is full of cowards and traitors and losers. And we had to put this operation together and get out there and do this whole coastline and document the extinction event. I'm not going to apologize to anybody on this planet for what I say and what I have to do because I am not supposed to have to do this. There are so many organizations that should have done the species counts. We're the last species counts on the entire coastline, the last species count. Nobody's ever done a species count after me because I contradict them, right? I've I done the whole coast, so no matter where they went and done their count, if they lied, I have them, see? And it's up at my website for free. So nobody can go out and fake it. If you do, I got an operation and I will go out there and they know that. So the very reason, the very fact that I exist stops them from spreading the lie that everything is healthy. This is the farthest thing imaginable from healthy. But it's one of those few spots. This is the most life you're going to find literally in any of my pictures at my website, or any of my videos anywhere. You are not going to go out and find anything different. This is it. This is wow. Wow. Look at a beautiful coastline. Look at all the life. When normally that's exactly what you would say. Normally that's exactly what you would see. Normally that's what you would spend all day doing. Normally this is what you couldn't wait to go have a boo at. This was most fascinating and dangerous. This was incredible diversity that everybody would understand it when they seen it. They would love everything about it. There was nothing there not to like. It was just amazing. You were enthralled all the time. You were totally drawn into this environment. You were at one with your world. You realized there was more to life than you when you seen this, when you were experiencing that, when you were living that moment, that day, that week, that hour, that trip, that expedition. Now you go out and it's naked. It's it's boring. It's 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 monotonous. It's just dreary. There's no inspiration. There's no. It's horrifying. It's untenable. It's an extinction event. Just a handful of species left. See how freaking gutty I am? I'm willing to get right up to the rock pile. Usually when I'm back onto the rocks, mind you, it's because I got washed around and I'm, I'm about to get out of there. I rarely am back on on purpose to the rocks. That's stupid. Because a wave will come in and throw your arse into that or capsize you, flip you straight up. Because when the waves come into the rocks, they, they change their direction. I don't know what's underneath me. It could push the waves up, right? Because when you're close to rock piles, waves show up out of the blue. We're talking about up here, a 20-foot tide exchange. So what you go and drop your anchor six hours later, is you don't even know where you're to. You're like, this is not where I dropped my anchor. Everything looks completely different. There could be now a thousand little islands in front of you that didn't exist six hours ago. But what I do is I go into this with my eyes open looking to document it. And I had high hopes every day. Very high hopes every day that I would find an oasis. 
this was the closest I came to the oasis. And this is irrelevant in anybody's books. There's nothing here to be excited about. Not just because I'm shitty with a camera, but because there's nothing there to be excited about. Okay, well, probably something. If I was really good with the camera, it still doesn't change the fact that it's terrible there, that it's pointless being there, that it's just, there's, you know, most people watching this right now are bored out of their friggin' trees. Well, see that up there is a limpet. They eat algae, eh? And there's, they usually come in, they are 10,000 on a rock. And there's 10,000 uh, periwinkles on that rock, and there's 10,000 snails on that rock, and it's the same thing on that rock and that rock, and every rock on the beach is covered with life, not naked, not with a handful of species over and over. This is what you see everywhere I go. The whole coastline, all my pictures, <laughs> this is the, well, you won't see as much. Right? Today is exceptional. But Dana, there's nothing there. You know, but it is exceptional. Trust me. Treasure it. And all of them are melting. All of them are bald. All of them have lost their roughness. All of them are, um, are, high, are highly affected by the radioactive materials from Fukushima. They're exposed to low tide. But see, they're such a fragile environment. And that they're your, they're, they're your nursery. This is the nursery of the Pacific Ocean you're looking at. The very nursery. What nursery, Dana? If that's the nursery, the Pacific Ocean, we're in trouble. Now you're getting it. There I am again, stirring on. Yeah, because the, the wind's supposed to pick up that night. I don't know if that's a fact or what. Pretty nice there. Just a current. Just making a turn, I suppose. Those rocks will be gone at high tide you see out there, or the majority of the rock, with any swells. That'll all be ground swells that night, obviously. I ran back, uh, if I remember correctly, that afternoon to Shearwater, which is a community of about 30 people, three hours north. But I was heading south, right? And go fuel the boat back up. So we. So, little Zodiac, generally, you can move anywhere with the big boat, take your time. And then the little Zodiac doesn't burn any gas. And so you can go all day for $1.52. And, but that's, you know, that's not easy to pull off. You got to get 4,000 for proper motors so you can put some fate into it because I'm not strong enough to roll a long distance. And then, and now we have a kicker on the Zodiac and a little cabin on it and the same Zodiac, right? So it's going to be, I won't be exposed to the environment anymore. I hope I go up and find all kinds of life. That's, I really do, right? I hope. Life comes back, and but we haven't stopped Fukushima. The other 4.2 million species haven't seeded the coastline. And brutal headache all day. Still kicking the shit out of me. Whatever. And so this stain is all the life where it melted for the most part. I don't know that particular stain, but most of the stain on the coastline, you'll see it. And so these nooks and crannies, where there's a handful of species hanging out, they're always the same species everywhere you go. No matter where you go, that's it. And there's no diversity. If I see anything interesting, I'll stop and zoom in or I'll go back rather than zoom in. And so you can cover a lot of territory doing what I'm doing. It's the ideal way to document to do species counts. Like, see, because normally you would go to a beach, right? And you put down a grid on the beach and you count all the species because there's tons of them there. So the best thing to do is go count all the species, right? You put a grid there and you count all these species that are inside that grid. That's what you would normally do. But we don't live in that world. The hell? We don't live in that world because everything is gone. So instead of this incredible diversity, right? So normally you expect to see just endless amount of life. And instead, 
as you can see behind me, the before and after pictures of the same spot. That's the same spot. Let's keep looking at how we're doing on time here. We're in good, good shape. Hi, everybody. And how is everybody? Yeah, there's not much I can do, Elaine. Thank you, though. Um, so we see just a few algaes and the same species over and over and over when the pictures are within reason. And you can see and most of the coastline is covered in logs up high from storms and that, but you know, these rock walls are too high for it. That's okay. So as you document the whole coastline, the low tide zones, you, you, you come to the realization at some point that we smurfed up big time. Oh, yeah, there's a big blowback from doing this one. We're not going to get away with this one. We're not going to just, oh, I'll all be okay. It'll all come back on its own. Now, all the kelp in the entire coastline, the entire coastline of Canada, in British Columbia, Canada, all the bull kelp, the most visible that's left there right now is the bull kelp. And this was the... Major nursery is now decimated and emaciated and lacking any kind of, it's, I've never seen it in all my years diving and all my years on the ocean. I've never seen all the coastline, all the kelp like that. I just, to me, that really tells the tale because I spend so much time underwater. I understand that, that habitat. And I used to fear that habitat. You can tear it apart with your hands now. But I've been hung up in that habitat, this kelp, this bull kelp that grows up to 50 feet, diving through it with the air hoses. And you get all tangled up in there. And you literally got to take your regulator out of your mouth if you're not wearing a full face. If you're wearing a full face, you got to peel that off and chew your arm out. Put your full face out, breathe for a while. Chew, chew, chew. And you lose every knife you take with you because we used to do it six hours a day. And there wasn't a knife you could hang on to. Or if you did, it was right in the way all the time. And got another video coming up. Just 39 seconds. So we... She died on a bird species count last year. She was something else, man. Or some dog boy. So 1001, 1002, This was a fuck up. It didn't work. It's only 39 seconds. Got no idea how this is going to work out. Let's try it, I suppose. It's almost over. It looks nice and calm, don't it? The current is flying, eh? Just flying by me. I'm trying to sync up the two cameras in that shot. It doesn't work out. I broke off one of the legs, so it's, I'm using a tripod. <laughs> Dina. I'm tripod killers. Tripod fear to see me coming. Every time I walk in the shop, all the tripods are like, don't pick me, man. And so there's nothing to take a picture of, but you got to document it just for the sake, because you're there and who else is going to do it? And other people can't do it. So if you do it, then everybody should be able to come that's got half um, interest will be able to find it and research it themselves without actually going to the spot and get a consensus. See, anybody that's honest. 
So if a marine biologist actually goes to my site, they know I've done the real job for sure. They know, they know I've done it better than, than that whole institution could have done. They know that I wasn't, I didn't leave nothing behind, that I, I didn't care how long it took. I didn't care how much energy it took. I didn't care how much work it took to get to my spot. I, I went the hardest routes usually because that's where the most life should be, out in the hard, roughest, toughest spots to get to. And sometimes the weather cooperates. That day the weather was cooperating. That night it didn't. It was shit that night. It was held the night before. We spent all morning from daybreak for till I burnt up all the fuel I could spare out searching for a lost boater. And the boat, low tide is still coming. We still got to get on the beach and get out and take our pictures and document it so we can get out of there and not be victims ourselves. And it was so despondent sometimes for me. But, you know, I took comfort in the fact that the job was going to be done proper. And I consoled myself that it wasn't going to be forever. And But when I come ashore, I have to spend all day, every day, not relaxing and recovering, but uploading the pictures to the Internet. These are big pictures. Each one of them are big files. And you're taking thousands a day. And so even the bad ones, I have to upload them in sync. Otherwise, people say, well, why didn't you upload number 223, Dana? You were hiding something. And that's exactly what they were doing with me originally. So I stopped saying, well, that's a blurry picture. That's a blurry picture. I'm not going to upload it. And I uploaded it. Anyway, but what that meant was I couldn't relax. Even when I came ashore, I couldn't recover. And then as I'm uploading the picture, I'm arrested in the middle of the night in my pajamas, taken away. Nobody tells me why I'm arrested. Nobody tells me anything. I am in front of a judge the next day. I'm the only person in the courtroom. And ultimately, they bankrupted me and gave me six gag orders so I can't talk about what they've done to you. I can't tell you for three and a half years about the monsters and the demons and the industry and what they've been up to. Just saying what I'm saying right there leaves me vulnerable. But, um, they, you know, I have no choice to do what I've done, and I have no choice to continue to do what I do. If I don't do it, nobody will do it. If I don't tell you the story at night, if you don't watch it, you will never know. Because nobody will tell you the story. No one will show you the documentation or the heartaches and the heartbreaks and the nightmares that go with it. If nobody really tries to impress it upon you. This is such an unusual spot. You could spend an entire year on that same coastline and not find a spot like that. One of the most... Now, they're all babies. They're all about the size of my thumb or so. There's nothing big there. That's a big one there. See? See the big one? Right? You can see the big one. There's a couple of big ones there, and the rest are baby ones. Very unusual to see anything, only that green urchin when there's 78 species of them. There's 480 species of worms. We only found around 10 species of worms of the saltwater worms, what they call categorized as worms. If you go back to my older videos, say uh, five months ago, six months ago, underneath it you'll find links to those studies of the species on the Canadian coastline. It might be there now. I don't know what I got there tonight. But. And so this was unusual spots. And kelp grass, let me go back to that picture, the kelp grass. See the kelp grass? Even that's dying all over the coastline. It looks like that. It looks like the, the other algaes, the kelps. And for a long time, I couldn't touch the pictures after Zoe passed away. I mean, I was doing a bird count. It just hurt too much. Even now, uh, now I find some comfort, I guess, in it. But it still, it still hurts me. So you can see the kelp uh, grass, or the, what's the proper name for it, is, is not healthy. So just a couple of algaes, naked rocks, when it should be. And so it's so boring 
for anybody watching this, my apologies that I can't show you the incredible diversity. It's not for lack of trying or wanting. It's just that I can't show it to you because it's not there anymore. It's gone. So normally I would show you all this beautiful. All the pictures would look like that. Every picture I took would look like this and this and this and this. Every single picture would be incredible, no matter where I was on the entire coastline. And every rock behind me would be covered in that that wasn't covered in all the other stuff. But I can't show you that today. I'm sorry. I apologize. There's not much I can do about it. I would love to, but the Pacific has been irradiated. And I got so many videos on my website. We're not going to touch on that stuff tonight. We're just trying to fly our way through these pictures so I can tell the story that I feel I have to tell. The calling that I had when I woke up this morning to tell this story it was something else. So I'm sure there's somebody out there that was supposed to show up and see this tonight. And that was supposed to change the future some way because they're going to make a stand or talk to somebody or tell that story and give it the exposure and finally kickstart the conversation. Is that what's going on? Is that why that urge was so... Is that why I worked so hard? Is that why we suffered so much? I don't know the answers anymore. I do know that the things we do are so important, are so relevant, are, are so necessary. It's horrifying that we are the ones that were forced to do it. And we were forced to do the species counts. Just a couple of algaes, if they go, everything else is gone. This is uh, algae, the bull kelp, that's only another species where it's only about two feet long. You know, And you only find it in rough surge areas like here, even though that day is not so rough. But there is a breaker. It's low tide, so there's a lot of breaking of any ground swells. Because straight across to Japan, Japan's jet streams take three days to get to this point right here. Like when, when you look at that, like feed that to something that like a like a deer eats that stuff. For instance, a deer's will come down to the shoreline. This is what they always done and ate this stuff. We're seeing the death of the Pacific uh, recorded. We've covered it extensively. A massive uh, emaciation of birds because they fly along the coastline looking for food, and they can't find anything. So normally the bird flies along the coastline, and he can just land wherever he wants and get himself a snack, right? You see how that works? He can just land to your left and get a snack anywhere he wanted. But the reason they died in, in like a half million at one time in one spot was they flew the whole coastline behind me, couldn't find food and starved to death. Now, all the whales, the killer whales, are emaciated. All of them here in British Columbia and Puget Sound in America, emaciated, confirmed, and dying, will die for sure. They were actually talking about blowing a fish farm and feeding them to feed the whales. In desperation, saying the military should blow big dams so the fish can come down and the whales can feed to save them because they have no hope if not. Emaciated, killer whales. They can eat octopus and halibut, birds, seals and sea lions, and big 2,000-pound sunfish, porpoises and otters and beavers and minks and you name it. There's nothing off their diet. And now they can eat a few orchards and some algaes. Horrifying. Now we're seeing the same thing with the seals and the sea lions. They're all emaciated, bags of bones. The mothers are milkless. They lead the, the young 
seals and sea lions to the cliff edges so they commit suicide. See, all the death of all the species now, nonstop, at an accelerated pace on top of that. We have unbelievable, unimaginable, inconceivable amount of documentation at this stage. But yet, nobody is allowed to have a conversation. Yet, I'm the worst person on the planet because I went out and took pictures. This is why people hate me is because I went out and took pictures. And I said, well, where's all the species? Where's that diversity? Where's that amazing, incredible smorgasbord of life that we are so used to, that we understand so well? Where is the color, right? Just any color besides the orchard sea star would keep whoever's watching the video around for a few more minutes. But I can't blame people for not being here because all I'm going to show you is the reality that there's nothing left. There's nothing beautiful to be seen there. And that every day was a living hell for me. And that I live in that hell every day now. And that this is my life now. This is whatever my life is left is at this full time so that you could uh, have a chance, your children can have an opportunity to fight for something, to plan for something, to organize for some kind of future, to, to prepare for what's really happening. And you're not being given that opportunity, it's been taken away from you on purpose, so you don't understand it. They vilified me in the media, like the Japan Times and the rest of them, See, every rock on that beach, in that shitty photo that I always take, so there's no good going there and doing a species count. There's no samples to take out of there. There's no color there. There's the, some of that. That's the green cabbage, the cabbage algae, what they call it, cabbage kelp. I go up on the beach, I guess, and this is what looks of it. Can't remember. Yeah, Zoe wanted to go pee. Oh, yeah, I remember that spot really good now. And it's all rocks, right? It's not a very good spot. Let's all you have a pee. We went sure in a bunch of little spots, I'm sure. So just kelp weed is what you're looking at on the shoreline there. Kelp weed is like popcorn. Uh, that was the most popular kelp in the world and here. And, but there's still jack of it. See, it should be covered in all the other species. If you got one here, you're on the open coastline. So everything should be covered. <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> My hand's going to sleep on me. Click, 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 click. We're doing pretty good. Let's keep going. <laughs> I'm addicted to click. I can't stop. This is a perfect job for you in that case. You get all your clicking you ever want right here, mister. He's clicking. Look at it. He's clicking. You click. Data, you click like nobody. <laughs> hey, Nadine, uh, if you're watching, your check showed up. 150, thank you so much. That was huge. And we, made, we raised $30 finally yesterday, too, at the same time. So tomorrow, I got to go pay 300 for the boat, for the wharf, for another month. So we head out on the next expedition in a few months. I'm in no rush to head back here. <laughs> I'm in a rush to head back here. But every time I open the door up, I'm not in no rush to head back out. <laughs> and so 717. So when we go this time, uh, when we go this time, we'll be taking a bigger boat with us, the sailboat and the Zodiac, and the little Zodiac on the roof of this big Zodiac has two motors for it now and a cabin, right? And then the sailboat is 11 feet wide and 32 feet long. So stupid amount of room on it. And we've gone in style this time. Well, the idea, I mean, it's really dangerous in the sailboat because the Zodiac, you go, and you're doing 55K 
and you're at a danger. The sailboat, you got to throw up beach lunch because you ain't going jack. You ain't doing jack shit. You're going to, anything happens, you got to tie it up to an island now and sit it out. But the, zo- uh, the sailboat, who cares? Because you got comfort, take a break, get organized, get everything dry again, plan out your route. When the weather breaks and it's not too windy, you throw up your sails and it doesn't cost a fortune. You don't have to be constantly worried sick. Now, at the same time as, uh, now we remember the biggest problem we had last year, so 717, Dana. 717. So last year, the, I'm looking for, touch something, there we go. So last time we done it was a big problem. I'll keep clicking. The big problem was bandwidth. We have to go into all these communities, find bandwidth, upload a video, show you some of the documentation, and raise enough money to do the next part of the coastline. Because that's how we done the whole coastline. <laughs> like, oh my God. I don't even want to think about it. I'm not going to go through that this time. <laughs> because for starters, for around, say, uh, $400, I can buy a 4G wireless for bandwidth. And whenever I get within cell phone, I don't have to look for restaurants or, or somewhere to find bandwidth. And because it takes forever, everybody's using the same bandwidth just to check your email, let alone you might have to sit there for five hours. That's hard to do at restaurants and places and upload a video, right? So now if you can buy, say, 25 gigabytes and I can crunch my videos down, one-hour videos to a gigabyte. In fact, I'll be able to live stream on that bandwidth by by rights. If I can get a cellular bandwidth, I'll be able to do some live streaming too. But I'll be able to upload um, large files to YouTube and to my site by going that route. Now, it costs quite a bit of money for 25 gigabytes, but not... I don't, I don't know what the number is, like 100 bucks a pop or 200 bucks a pop or something. But that's 25 uploads, one gigabyte uploads. That's one hour of videos, fairly good quality that I can do, right? And so I'll be sailing in the harbors on the sailboat. It might take me five hours to get through the har- to, the, to tie up the boat. I'll have cell phone range the whole time so I can upload the videos the whole time, right? And so I won't be worked to death. Every, every moment of every day in every facet like I was um, all the way up to now. When I leave and go in the spring, I'll probably leave pre-spring, obviously, because i got a sailboat, i got to tug the Zodiac and the equipment. It's going to be hellish. And we got to go do all this again, the whole bloody coastline again, and document it all again to quantify... Um, the findings, right? To repeat, the, you have to repeat the experiment because then the planet has to uh, pay attention. It's waiting, right? Now they're waiting for that, see? This is why they attack me so much because they fear me so much. They know that the truth that I bring to the table is indisputable. It's incontestable, uncontestable. The things I say, the things I do, um, See, I don't come from the bling-bling that everybody has been fed their whole life. I'm just a normal person. So it's easy to marginalize me and, and just blow me off as somebody who is insignificant or it doesn't matter. But ultimately, you'll realize that um, I was the real person. I am the real deal. I did do the moral and ethical thing. I'm not some imaginary I'm not some, uh, I'm not making stuff up. I actually went out and done all the work. When you see all the rocks are naked everywhere you go, then how, hi Zoe, then how do you turn a blind eye? We shredded that zodiac and screwed it up. I got sick of it. We got a new one. And a new one's much easier for me to get up on the roof of the zodiac. Like, Literally nothing to it for some reason. It's wider and I don't know, there's something about the shape maybe, but it goes up on the roof super simple. I was so happy. I was terrified when I put it, tried to get it up on the roof for the first time. And I was like, Ugh. the other one was a nightmare. 
this ain't going to be any better because it's wider, right? And so I figured it was going to be an even bigger nightmare. And it's, it is in one way, like for fitting it on the roof after, but getting it up onto the roof, straight up, no stress. I was like, my biggest fear is not for real for a change because I figured every day, because I have to do that every day, put it back on the roof for per se. Because we're using a sailboat, we'll stop the sailboat and we'll be able to go 30, 40 miles one way in increments and then 30, 40 miles the other way without moving the sailboat, leave the sailboat where it's to. And that'll save us time, energy, money and free me up to do a much better job, even though there's nothing wrong with what I've done. It's just I had all these corporations and industries and the nuclear apologists and the nuclear lapdogs and the stock markets and the universities and the, and the nuclear students and their families and everybody attacking different countries, attacking me because I'm the only opposition that they see out there. Because this is obviously nuclear is a death cult. They have no remorse for what they got done. She was such a good dog, folks. You wouldn't believe it. What, what a great dog she was for doing that job. She was such a happy dog every day, all day long. She was an unbelievable joy. Just a joy, man. And she was all, I used to have to lift her to do everything, but she was such a, just a beautiful thing, beautiful creature. But she's the only color on the beaches every day. That was the stunning part for me each day. And the sadness of it was she was always the first. She would jump off the bow and bang herself into those rocks. Right? Get her, shake herself off and go frig off and piss somewhere, right? But she was such a happy dog. And every day I would look at that and I would say to myself, she's the only color on the beach. And as I'm snapping my pictures, she's waiting dear. What she wants dear now is she wants me to put her aboard the boat, right? That's what that picture was about. She wants to be. She wants me to come over and pick her up and put her in the boat. Goofy. I called her loser. That's a, <laughs> that was my personal pet name. Uh, that, and she would always uh, act silly when I call her loser. Hello, loser. Jack. And she'd get very right goofy for me. Right there. Her name was Zoe. Now oh, we got another little clip coming up. Look how naked everything is. Before we run into that, the rock should be covered, physically covered in material. The whole coastline should be covered. Everything should be covered. Incredible diversity in colors everywhere you look. No matter where you go, it's, uh, this was what made BC unique and fantastic. And just wonderful. And this is why people came from all over the world to experience it. This is what made, this is what was the driving force with me all my life. This is what I covered. This is what I would brag about in the restaurants and then when I'm hanging out with family or friends. This is what my passion was, my, my absolute, it, it, it was something. There was something about it for me that I can't really explain. I don't think there's an emotion or a word that can justify the awe, that awe feeling, right? That utter incredible jolt you got every day from that. You just, there's something about it. But when you went out like this, there was nothing there to... Uh, Twenty seconds. Yeah, I had to change the lens, run back in, and I hope that gives us some better pictures. It's hard to see with the sun starting to shine, though. So we're going to do that side of the islands, and some rocks out front. It's still okay out there. Not too bad. Not too bad. And the camera shows us otherwise, don't it? So low tide is. <clears throat> just changing probably during there's a scene enemy he's a pretty big fella right and that's the, that's one of the few I've seen out of the water adults 
and they grow up to three feet. And normally the whole shoreline is covered. They, you get up to 500 per square meter. Not one for coastline. This was a very, he wasn't a big adult, but the fact that I found him was that was uh, significant. It's the same species, the, the, the joint plume. And so for the most part, unless I drag in some colors, everything is pretty boring. Besides the fact that I, I'm not the worst person ever to have a camera. People who own the camera were like, that's not my, that's not our camera. Even he couldn't screw up our camera. And so the flora and the flana, a lot of the forest is dead along the coastline. It's really obvious off the shoreline. But at the high tide line, there was an incredible amount of flana and flora. It's all missing. I got no idea what I'm shooting there, but. Oh, yeah, that's the high tide line. Right? Up above the high tide line, there should be all kinds of life there. Most of my pictures are that's included. And it would show up on the trees that are stuck there. The species that would normally live at the high tide, right above the high tide, very rarely, only on a full moon, would those species be on underwater. And the green sea anemone is one of them. You would find just a big band, like, say, uh, three to five feet wide. The whole coastline, every rock would have it. Well, 99.9% .9 would have it, all right? <coughs> So we're getting close to the two hour mark. We're up to 786. And they're not really not going on. So let me click, click. Let's start moving through these quicker. Anything interesting, I'll pop back. So that was kelp, uh, cabbage. The green stuff is cabbage kelp and some barnacles. But all the, in, the green seen enemies, again, just the baby ones, of course. And some. Uh, some sponges on the rock, black sponges in the last couple of pictures. It's hard to identify them because the pictures are not. Those pictures weren't very high quality. It's just a couple of algaes if they go and clam and orchard sea star, sea anemones, slime, a couple of uh, sponges. And so these are unusual to see that even this much life when it should be that incredible, unbelievable, unimaginable. Um, diversity there and zip through these pictures so you get pretty sick of seeing the same starfish and the same scene enemy over and over and over everywhere you go yeah it becomes insignificant but it's significant because they they show up randomly throughout the coastline there most of the coastline looks exactly like this at best the majority of is actually completely naked. And all of this should be just loaded. All of this is underwater, even the top, right? The water, you can drive through there in the speedboat at high tide, in the big boat at high tide. And so you would expect to find just this incredible diversity in the tide zones here because it's only exposed for a few hours of daylight for the most part. You're not getting a lot of double tides. Double tides this time of the year. There was uh, the next low tide was nighttime. But the big low tide, the biggest low tide was in the daylight. Which is why we've done the expedition the way we've done it, right? Get the low tide, get daylight. Because that works better than nighttime, trust me. I'm pretty bad with a camera in daylight. You wouldn't want me at there at night time with a camera. Well, now not so bad, but back then, yeah. So we go and investigate all the coastline, all the little nooks and crannies. A lot of these places nobody has ever walked or will ever walk again. There's nothing to see there anyway. It's pretty boring. So when you get clean shots... So you only need that one picture to cover the last 200 pictures if you're an academic who studies this stuff. You don't need to see the last 200 pictures. You just need a picture like that. You say, well, it's all gone. But, of course, that's not going to be good enough for the budding academics. They need everything. And we need 
just close up. Because a lot of this picture, you can clear up anything that's grainy and extract any marine life that might have been there and put it into the account, which is what literally all the major institutions would have done with my pictures. They would have downloaded all my pictures and done exactly that, but they won't release the documentation. So statistically speaking, the work we've done was important for everybody out there, but they wouldn't give us recognition or help us or donate to us for the most part because that would give the game away on their end, right? But they gladly stole the documentation and then they uh, cooked up a bunch of lies and smeared the shit out of me to try to get rid of me, right? So when they arrested me in the dark and late at night in my pajamas, they were attempting to get rid of me. They had some real evil intentions when they done that to me originally. We defeated them because I, I got back in their faces like over time. And I, I, bl I blew it back up in their faces relentlessly from there on out. There's no mercy on my end. I don't withhold or withdraw Jack when I get wound up like trying to defend myself so we went out we showed the depictions of the reactors we showed the lies we showed the headlines now you got to realize we covered thousands of headlines about the ocean before we went on the ocean on the expedition we're not like random oh let's go ahead and check the ocean now i have a long history my whole life on the ocean up to this point so and i got injured but that didn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. That don't mean I'm all of a sudden, oh, he, he got injured, so he's stupid now. He, he's irrelevant now. He got injured. Forget him. Oh, he was crippled. Fuck him. He's useless. He's an idiot now. He's crippled. That's what people were saying. Remember that in the chat room? Why, why are you listening to a cripple for? He's in a wheelchair. Why are you giving him any time? See, and that's another thing where anybody can do rehab and get on with a reasonable life. But Dana, the fact that I finally was able to stand up and do a few things on my own, the, the trolls out there blew that out of proportion. Took that and tried to say that I was a scam artist. They were out there. It was horrifying. It was absolutely, they're still at it, but that was horrifying. That anybody else can, can partially recover or fully recover, except for Dana Durnford. He can't recover. No way. He, there's no way he's allowed to recover. He's not allowed to work hard and do things and be normal like everybody else. Dana's supposed to be crippled for the rest of his life, permanently, never, ever allowed to try to rehabilitate himself. And so many people out there that supported me bought into the narrative because they never thought it through. And going out on the ocean, me doing all this by my own, what do you think happened? I started getting stronger. And then my wheelchair got washed overboard. And so I had to make a decision. Do I keep going? Do I go find another wheelchair? Blah, 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 blah. And I spent over a decade trying to get out of my bed. The last thing I wanted to do was get back in it. And I forced myself every day to do what you're seeing and do the job. And for that, I was vilified and humiliated and smeared and attacked and viciously attacked for trying to be a bit, trying to get my life back. Viciously smeared, even today. If someone sees me standing up and walking, it's all of a sudden like, you're walking? You're walking? What? I work like a dog. And then someone would dare do that to me. Instead of celebrating it, that, that I can get up and do shit, I was attacked and smeared. And it was used to bludgeon me. It's still being done. Those people, I would break your neck in a heartbeat. You disgusting parasites. You vicious, horrible monsters. You despicable goblins. You horrible, horrible public relation firms. You pro-nuclear, totally, totally despicable people. They seize upon anything to assault me, anything to attack me, anything to try to humiliate me so that you wouldn't even give me the time of the day. So you wouldn't hear me out. So you wouldn't consider anything. I guess somebody just donated $100. You got any idea how desperate I am at <laughs> this stage? Thank you. Roy. Ray. Sorry. 
And so, like, that's got to go and buy the, the marina now, actually. Finish the painting for the marina tomorrow. And I got to raise enough money to buy this and quite a bit more. I probably won't get none of it. <laughs> probably go with no beach lines. <laughs> But I will go, I can assure you. I'm just so sick of asking people to support me. I was vilified so much. That was the point, right? So I wouldn't ask, and so that people wouldn't support me. So people would abandon me, so I couldn't finish out the expeditions. Right, do you get it? Let me show it to you. So by finishing out the expeditions, doing the whole coastline, all the arrows are just representations of the places that I've done. By doing that, I was able to show definitively that all the species were missing. And so they had done everything in their power to destroy me and my reputation and to attack anybody that affiliated themselves with me. But I'm not a bad person. I worked so hard to get this, to see this through. I'm not gullible, I'm not naive, and I'm not a bad person. I'm the hardest working person at this period. There is nobody else out there has come close to producing the material that I produce or ever will. There's nobody out there. If I stop right now, nobody could outproduce me. I doubt it highly. I produce more material than all of them put together as far as I can tell. And I took all their lies and I explained their lies. I walked everybody through their lies. I walked everybody repeatedly through their lies. I walked everybody through the lies. <laughs> this is a polite way of putting it. We've ran into them head on, man. We've banged into the goblins and the demons, the nuclear industry trying to cover this up. So they can pretend that they're special to their idiot family and their idiot friends and their idiot loser partners and their stupid, idiotic, murderous, inbreed parents and family members that attack me to protect the fact that their loved one, that they think of a loved one because they're actually monsters, is working for the nuclear industry. I, I make them look bad. So then they have to lash out at me because they won't accept the reality. It's so shocking when I'm so honest, I'm so open, I'm, I'm completely 100% on the ball. And I've, I've done the entire coastline repeatedly at great, at great harm and great, and great amount of time and energy and coordination and effort and luck and certainly help from a community that's seen there's a crab behind me, see that? But there's a small percentage of people out there who realize that Dana Durnford is actually a reasonable person. Yeah, he's a little bit wild, but he's a good guy. And they seem fit to support me. And I can't possibly name them all. I would love to have that memory. I should just memorize everybody, I suppose. That wouldn't be very hard for me. Lord knows I memorize so much. I should really re memorize everybody's name and just so that I can make sure I know everybody. And because, like, see, uh, I'm not random, right? I plan things out. I think things out dramatically. I, go, I, go, I take it to a whole different level of planning things out. And I, and I understood what I was up against when I decided I was going to take on the coastline and how difficult it was probably going to be for me. And I participated that some people would reach out and help me and that I would have, give me the benefit of a doubt and that once I started, they would see the valid points that I was making and then life can change, didn't we end up? Let's keep. Back off the water here. Yeah, down to I screwed up, went back up or something. So I got a jellyfish. 
So I anticipated some people would help me and then I would suffer. I wasn't expecting to suffer like I did. And, but they were, the nuclear industry was hard at work destroying me. And thank goodness, most people, um, not most people, but a small, tiny, tiny percent of people understood that uh, I was going to get this job done and that I was worthy of helping and supporting and standing alongside of in solidarity and seeing it through. Even the morbid, even though it was a morbid task to think about what we were doing, thank goodness there was this small group of rebels. That's how I see you people, a group of rebels. That said, you know, I frigate. I don't need this or I don't need that. And by and by, over time, and we had a lot of major screw-ups. We went through an incredible amount of hurdles. We were being assaulted and victimized and attacked. Still are, relentlessly. I just tuned it all out, right? But we were under siege. The first year, we were, on, everybody here knows that, knows anything about this, knows I was under siege. But I focus. I know how to focus. That's why I do what I do, obviously. And I was so focused that, you know, in a normal day, I would go looking for those people and sort that out. But there was a job to be done. See, to me, when I park, when I look like that and see that shoreline, that means everything's gone. It's gone. And you see that? That's gone. And that shoreline over there? I, that's no good for you, though, for the average person. I got to go document everything. Nice tide right there. So the tide on these coastlines are frightening, man. They pull you up on a rock pile, lickety split. I must admit, though, we were extremely cautious in everything we'd done. Like we, we were obviously over cautious, me and Zoe, but well, there's no one to come find me if I don't show up. There's no one there to yell help to. There's no one, you know, the routine, right? Unfortunately, a lot of us know that routine all too well. But the idea is I got to come back with the documentation. So I could have went and got a big bow for comfort, but that wouldn't have got the job done because we didn't know what we were up against and we have to go into the roughest places imaginable and pull it off. And so the best thing was the Zodiac was by far the best option at that time because we weren't sure. We, we, we wanted to be able to shoot out and find out in these little weird spots and get out of there before the weather changed. And only speed can pull that off. And the Zodiac has a Kevlar bottom, so it's very forgiving when you hit the rock piles. And trust me, that don't help. Your heart falls right out of your chest when you hit the rocks and you're stuck. And you, you know you're in trouble. And you know that this, this, is, could, be, this could be fatal. You could be stuck in the middle of nowhere. If you're lucky, you're just stuck somewhere. If not, you're in a whole lot of trouble. So all of these little nooks and crannies, the little Zodiac is just unbelievable, eh? You can get right in those little weird spots. And this is something we was really unusual. It was very hard to find clamshells. For the most, like normally the beach is covered, and you would find... Uh, a lot of beaches that were made of clamshells had no clamshells on it. But the, but the sand was made of shells over millenniums, but yet there was no shellfish anywhere to be found. That, to me, was the wildest thing. And that, that is manifested in the underwater footage where you don't see shellfish everywhere. And so there's something happened there with the radiation and the shellfish. There's something happened that made the shells extra brittle, for sure. And so normally when you come ashore in the Zodiac, you don't come that close to the shoreline because under the water somewhere is going to be these little creatures. <laughs> and I can assure you, uh, they don't travel by themselves. They're always minimum in pairs. <laughs> no, actually, they're usually in football fields. And so the fact that we were able to come ashore anywhere, let me get moved these pictures back for 
So the fact that we're, let me jump the picture to it here. Yeah, so when you're coming into those spots, here's a better picture here. Coming up to the shoreline is terrifying normally. I never a single time, not a single time, did I worry about the normal, the biggest fear of every zodiac. There's even a sea cucumber in this picture, but this is not from my expeditions. This is pre-Fukushima and Louise Narrells in Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte Islands in British Columbia, Canada. So the zodiac, you're normally just no, not going in, not going in here. There's, right, you want to have rock pile. It's so hard to land in a soft bottom zodiac because of the sea urchins, let alone a hard bottom where your pontoons might accidentally bump up against barnacles on the rocks and pop a hole. Didn't have to worry about that. We did have that happen to me in one spot, though. We flipped the boat over, too, after the blown pontoon at nighttime. And I washed up on the rocks that night, <laughs> done thousands of dollars worth of damage. But six days later, well, we had to limp into port on a kicker, and then six days later, we flew back out and done the whole, finished off the coastline, per se. So all the species are gone. We're now up to two hours and 12 minutes. And We're at 916. Let's keep going for a while. Let's blast through. So there's nothing to be seen. There's nothing to be seen. 923. Zip through a bunch of these pictures here before we give it up. So there's like a lot of people weren't going to sit through this video. It's too boring. There's nothing to look at. There's no colors. They get bored really quick if I'm not here trying to explain every second and every inch of it, right? I I get that. I understand that. But what it is is I got to go document it and tell that story and show the world definitively, unequivocally, that we we are in end times. And if you see the little snails... Now, every rock should be covered in hundreds of thousands of these little snails. When you find one, there should be 100,000 right away. As you come ashore, you expect to find every rock covered with them and all the other species. And so we did find hermit crabs quite a bit, uh, but not the, the massive numbers I'm used to. But we did find them quite a bit, by the way. Just There's some sponges there at that time. 70, 78 species of sponges, around 78 species of sea anemones coming in multiple colors, around 700 algae, highly visible species, and 76 species of sea anemones, usually in multiple colors. Uh, amongst all that would be 5,600 or so invertebrates without the backbones, just seeing the the kelp cab or the kelp weed, but that's it. Everything else is naked. And so it was so like it's so boring every day to do that. It's so boring all day long. There's nothing to look at, nothing to admire. There's nothing good about what you're doing. It just seemed surreal the whole time. But I was so happy to be out there documenting it. I wasn't like, yeah, man, I'm going to show everybody now. No, I was like, I'm going to have to sh tell this story. I better not screw this up. I better make sure that I, I cover everything. I got to cover everything. I'm just buzzing through the pictures at this stage. I got to look away all the time to keep up with it. Each row has five pictures. And there's something like 1,300 pictures total to buzz through. We're currently at 964. That feels a bit better. Uh, 500 to go or something.
I'm just, we're not going to get through them, obviously. I'm just going to go for another little tiny bit. I'm just going to start running through them now. Run, rabbit, run. So a couple of algaes there that we don't normally see. Well, we see them throughout the coastline, but they're the same species no matter where I go. They're not going to be a whole bunch of species. Uh, the same species that we see everywhere. It's just when you added them all up, you ended up with about 100 species. Uh, and very and none of it was healthy. None of it was very populous. There wasn't a great amount of these. So you can see the little snails, those little white spots. I think they're the snails. The little black spot, the black dots are, though. Yeah. And get a very clean pictures. Oh, I screwed up, did I? There we go. It doesn't. I got to watch what I'm doing here. It's okay. I got her. I'm just going to keep, keep buzzing for a few minutes. So it's beyond boring every day, beyond maddening. And like, the job's got to get done, though. You can't, you can't turn your back on anything. These are, are large barnacles, but yet I didn't find large barnacles. But these are, and, sh and some clams. I didn't find any, I didn't see any clams squirting at, uh, at the low tide. But I didn't find the large barnacles, but there's the rem remnants of them. I did on some spots of the coastline, mind you. And so there was life there, or those shells wouldn't exist, right? Those shells, right? Those, that type of life is there somewhere to create those shells in the first place. But we didn't find them like you normally would expect to find. You didn't find like the double shells very often. You just found the broken stuff, right? You weren't finding, like you would find, if you, when you see that many shells, you expect to see thousands of, of shells just not pulled apart yet, still in good shape, fresh shells that have been taken out by otters or minks or through the weather or something like that. These rock piles, these are just amazing normally places. These are the best spots. There's the most habitat there. Right? These are, there's a whole bunch of little caves there, see, at low tide for everything to hide out and shelter on top of that. And so it would repopulate itself if there was any harm or damage there. So we're just flying through the last little tiny bit. It's 819. We'll go the other 10 minutes, I guess, and see what we get out of it. So there's a starfish. So you didn't see, you see them underwater once, say, 20 spots on the coastline? Just once, though, or maybe twice at best. And so we need another handheld GPS. And we need a lot of gear. I need an ice maker so I don't have to keep burning fuel going to places. I can stay out there. I don't know how much expensive. I haven't looked them up yet. It's just an idea, right? And there's another bunch of other stuff. So the microscope uh, this time on the, on the sailboat, we can put the microscope on the sailboat. I think that's definitely got to get done like a digital one so we can just snap pictures the same as the underwater camera can snap pictures. The batteries we got to do for sure. The tow rope we got to do soon so I can start practicing. Uh, the auto steering, we got to get that done. That has to be done. I got to do that. I'm by myself, right? And what normally takes me an hour will take me a day or two now. And I'll be exposed to the element the entire time. And so next month when the weather starts to break a bit, I'm going to build a little cabin on a sailboat. I already got a design. Well, we got you here. Might as well talk about that for a minute. Oh, you're not plugged in. Excuse language. I can fix that, won't you? <laughs> uh, speaking of which, I think I, I just will. And then... We'll let the pictures play on their own for a few seconds. We're at 1,008. All right, 
count down to computer. Hang on. We'll get there in a second. Where's Dana? Okay. Shut that off. So I'll screw this up. Oh, don't go backwards, Dana. And just to show you what I'm talking about, it's not insanely hard to do what I'm talking about, but coming up here in a second. Hi, everybody. Whoa, Lane. Lane, you're the last one should shoot them. This. You shouldn't be donating. Lane has donated beyond anything conceivable. And I'm going to have to reload because I just screwed up. You might get a blurp blurp on your end. And sailboat hardtop. Just so you can get an idea of what I was talking about. I got one there that I picked out. That one here. This is what I'm going to do to the sailboat. Not going to be as elaborate as that or something. Don't get me wrong. But this is what we're going to do with the sailboat. Because otherwise I'm going to be exposed all the time. The rain's going to be going inside the boat where we got all the equipment, the microscope, all the cameras, all the clothing, everything. So we're going to build a similar cabin, not a cabin per se, but I can actually do a really nice job of... Um, with fiberglass. I can do equal to that for sure. As nice as that, no problem. And as elaborate as that, not, it's not an issue. It's not very expensive for me to pull that off. And so I will be doing that to the sailboat. That'll look, that's what my sailboat looks like, exactly like that. And because the spar is right above your head, the mass is right above your head, your mine will be a little bit higher than that, and I'll have shelter. And the idea is put the autopilot... I won't be stuck out on the deck all the time and we can keep the interior warm and dry. And we like to bring people with us. And so we're open to bringing people with us. I guess there's not much more I can say tonight, is it? Not much more I can say tonight. Yeah, agreed, Debbie. Thank you, Elaine. Hi, Denise. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean, dear. Thomas, hi. Jackie. Hey, bumblebees and honey this year. Good. Flies. Not too many. Dragonflies, butterflies. Yeah, this summer was a few insects at my place, I noticed. Compared to the last couple of years, a pleasant surprise. And you can donate at the nuclearproctologist.org also, folks. Links are below the video. And PayPal. Um, is the better way, I think, to donate for people. And I, like, I don't mind people donating like that at all. Don't get me wrong. I'm just making sure everybody understands you can. And so when you see Debbie, for instance, say, please donate... The links are below my video, and she's just reminding people. She assumes, like most people would, that everybody knows that. And she's just a reminder, and we thank her for that. I watch and wait, and so that's the end of the stream, folks. We're going to give it up. Hi, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, six gig orders of six gold medals. I'm so glad Joe reminds me of that, because I forget a lot of the times. But see, we call them gold medals. Not gag orders, and I should do that too. Hi, Strontium. Not too colorful. Well, there's no colorful. There's no color. Uh, how's it going, Strontium? And he's a blogger, folks. Anybody's not familiar? M Thirst. I keep. I just as easy to call you Debbie. If I call you Debbie, nobody knows who I'm talking to, per se, down the road, right? So. Call you M Thirst. That becomes your name, folks. New Brew Magic 2012. 
Yeah, we haven't seen him for a couple of years. He gave up, I guess. He was going to come with me originally back in the day, and then he didn't. That's too bad. He was welcomed. And thank you, Ray. That's okay. Um, I'm just coming in and say goodnight to everybody now, or anybody that happened to be in the comments section. And so you can see I don't get much of a comment section generally, right? And that's okay, too. <laughs> Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah. Thank you, Naomi. And hugs for everybody. Solar. Hi, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I guess that's the show for the most part, yeah? Is there anything to be gained by me sitting here for another half an hour and finishing out the pictures? You can go over to my website. We're up at uh, 1,054. It was in the same order. You will find the same order at my website under Calvert Island. Calvert Island. You'll find it at the nuclearproctologist.org. And you can see the rest of the pictures yourself. All you got to do is run over there when you get around to it. And everything will show up where we left off. Just go through a thousand pictures, scroll down until you get to a thousand fifty seven, fifty eight. See if I can find a landmark so you can get find that picture as you're cruising through them. You get close to it. That's how I do it, right? When you get close to it, you can. I just need a picture to stand out, and then I could find it generally. Let me see. There you go. So when you get to a thousand, you're looking for a picture of the zodiac, and then behind next pictures after that will be kelp. One, two, three, four kelp. In the fifth kelp, will have a piece of the zodiac to your left. The sixth and the seventh after, and then you can pick up right there and go through the last couple of hundred pictures, and then slightly another seven or eight more kelp, and then you'll see zodiac on the bow. Zodi, my puppy was on the bow. And then open pictures after of the coastline, looking out. And the tide's starting to come up, obviously, at that stage. And thank you for everybody who had the time and energy and effort and the will to see this to the end of the video. I apologize for not going the extra half an hour. That's two and a half hours straight. That's enough. Uh, and I got a headache all day, and <laughs> like I haven't stopped all day trying to figure out how I'm going to... Looking for news, searching news, doing this. takes forever to load all these pictures up on the software, by the way. Because every picture is such a big file, right? And it takes forever to load all these pictures into the computer, it was hellish. And then trying to get it to go live tonight, you notice I was a minute or two behind, and um, that's okay, shitty camera. My other camera battery is good for two hours and 30 minutes, and the battery for a live stream is pretty darn good for a battery, if you ask me. Let me fix that. Yeah, so like I was loading up uh, 1,500 pictures onto my computer and um, it was like not cooperating, man. There was too much, like 10 gigabytes or something and it has to give me a thumbnail of everything and so it won't let you do anything else till it renders. It's, it's a long day to get to this stage for sure. It's a long night for everybody on top of that. I started the video off uh, with music. I guess we'll end it with music. You know, find some music. And so I can't hire a big staff. I can't get a whole bunch of people to sit there. I don't have a studio per se. 
What is incredible is that we made it this far, that we're able to bring you this documentation, that we're able to bring it into a format that you're familiar with, that we're able to juice the industry. We're able to go out there and put expeditions together and verify, document an extinction event. That gotta be worth something to somebody somewhere sometime, don't it? Uh, if you go over to my website, The Nuclear Proctologist, you'll be overloaded uh, right away in one context. Just settle down, you'll find your way around. You'll find also a lot of pictures bring them up here before the night's over. You'll find other pictures that tells you how much labor the computer has gone through. But you'll find the documentation of the reactors, the fake pictures that they faked and shoved down everybody's throats. And um, the before and uh, these are where they're pretending the pictures are the exact same, fake versus real pictures. This is not before and after, this is fake versus real. They say both of those pictures are the current reactor. And so they will work hard now to destroy me, to, mur to physically murder me. Because that's all they got, they got nothing else. This is their legacy, is just mass murder. Killing someone like me is easy for them. And because I'm vulnerable and not very healthy, uh, they're more inclined to kill me because they're savages, they're remorseless uh, murderers who are exterminating your planet. And at some point you will stand up. At some point you will fight for your lives. At some point in the near, next couple of years, all of our worst nightmares will come true. That's a fact. You can't wipe out the Pacific Ocean without wiping out the planet right behind it. Everything is emaciated, all the birds, all the mammals, all the seals, all the whales, all the sea lions. Everything is dying in mass. It's time to do the moral and ethical thing. Destroy nuclear with every breath you have. Never give it an inch. Drive it over the cliff. Hugs for everybody.